I basically had 24 hours to build a full-size quarter pipe with whatever materials were on the island or that we could get to the island on a speedboat. It sounds so ridiculous. That whole week was like being paid to do what I spent my entire childhood doing for free. When my mum died end of last year, I just hit complete burnout. It floored me. I wasn't myself anymore. Decided to take some extended time off to heal. A big part of how I did that was through creativity. Hello, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first episode of my new podcast, Art After Dark, where we explore the transformative impact of the arts on mind, body and soul. I'm your host, Louise Emily, an artist on a mission to shed light on the power of human creativity. Our artistic explorer today is Adam Holmes, a Sussex-based, self-described human Swiss army knife. Adam has spent the past 16 years working in businesses across industries as a graphic designer, marketeer, creative director, film producer and business partner at creative production company Brother Film. He's an occasional woodworker and is currently halfway through a sabbatical, taking a well-earned break from the past few years, enjoying a chance to recover and recultivate his mind whilst he works out what he wants to do when he grows up. As you can see, darkness has fallen. It's time to welcome Adam to the forest. Welcome, Adam. Hello. 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 Thanks for having me. Oh, it's lovely to see you. You look completely ready for the forest, more than more so than me. I think I'm a fair weather forester today. I've yeah, I decided I'd go full full lumberjack shirt in a in readiness for the for the night in the forest. Brilliant. I love it. First question: Have you packed your bag with your three creations? I have. Do you want to see it? Oh, uh, this is a it's called a Salcan bag. It's basically a brilliant bag. It's my favorite backpack. I've got a bigger version of it from them as well. But basically two really nice guys who met traveling and decided that bags weren't good enough. So they'd make their own one. And they're just really, really nice bags. They're really comfortable. They get lots in them. They've got lots of fun little like useful pockets and stuff. Oh, I love a, pocket. It's a good bag. I really like it. It's very appropriate for the forest. What yes. snack have you? Bought? I have got some Biltong. Oh, but I got built on because my dad used to live in Cape Town for most of my childhood. So I used to visit there a lot. And I just really like, I really like built on. It's also a great stack for the woods because it kind of doesn't really go off. It lasts for ages, gives you good energy. It's tasty, nice, chew. It's a good one for sharing with people. Again, very, you're very like on format. Aren't Going you? straight. Straight in. 100% metaphor all the way. 100%. What was the drink that you brought? The drink I've just got. Good old fashioned water in a metal bottle, mainly because water is the OG drink. So why not have water? And I'm trying to be a bit more healthy and avoid fizzy drinks and sweet things and that kind of thing. And I'm trying to avoid drinking out of plastic. So I've got a nice metal bottle from Ocean Bottle. They're very nice. I like a bottle where you can hold on to it. Yeah. Mainly because I like the idea of like putting a carabiner on it, attaching that to my bag, mm. just to really like go straight into the the real feeling of being an outdoorsy person. Well, I'm not really, but you know, oh, it I helps me pretend. So it's nice. Yeah. I was just about to say, I bet you've got some carabiners. I bet you have. This is like, this is absolute. Oh, the bottom's lovely as well. Like oh, yeah. Orangey red. Little orange bottom as well. It's nice, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Nice. I'm quite I sure. really rate, they're honestly really good bottles. I rate Ocean Bottle. And they do, you know, they're trying to save the planet. That's a nice thing to do. Yeah, definitely. Love it. Right. Oh, you know what? Speaking of carabiners, my bag's actually got one on it. Of course it has. I honestly never doubted that. Adam. <laughs> <laughs> which has obviously only ever been used for clipping water bottles to it and has had no climbing experience in its life and rope climbing terrifies me because i'm scared of heights yeah that is, that is, <laughs> that is a bit of an issue well luckily we're in the forest so we're going to keep both feet squarely on the ground so i think it's time you seem completely ready probably more ready than you'll ever be to choose your first creation that's going to light the path for us so can you tell us your first creation adam yes i can so creation number one is a collection of BMX ramps that I used to make as a kid. When I was like maybe seven or eight onwards, me and a couple of other kids would just go and spend the entire weekend rummaging around my dad's garage, finding what we could to build a ramp, spend most of the weekend building it, and then jumping our bikes over it. And we did that all day, Saturday and Sunday, from seven till about 15, I reckon. That's just how I spent my entire... Basically, until I discovered... Drinking, smoking, and drugs. That's how I spent the rest of my time. It was great. <laughs> Don't do drugs. And it was great. Like, I absolutely loved it. And we used to, to... we. I don't know how we were allowed to do this, but we used to jump over the other kids. So, like, we'd build a ramp and then get kids to lie down in front of it and see how many of the kids we could jump over. Yeah. And that was just... Do you, do you remember was, the record? How many, how many... I think I used to be able to do... 
This is, that sounds ridiculous, but it's a hundred percent true. I see like five people lying down like sardines, and I jump all five of them. <laughs> a little ramp. <laughs> Like they're only kids, but they're still like, te- you know. I, I, I wouldn't want to be the one on the end, just in case you just click. No, no, that was always like, you'd always, it was normally, it was, this is the 90s, it's very sexist, but like we'd normally have the guys be like the ones building the ramps and cycling. And then when we finished, we were ready. We try and convince everyone's sisters to come and like lie in front of this thing so we could all jump our bikes over them, basically. But we'd always put one of the guys on the end just in case you got hurt. We didn't want to hurt one of our little sisters, essentially. Yeah, you wouldn't be allowed to go out again. That's the problem. You're protecting the next day's endeavours. Yeah, protecting the fun. I mean, they would range from anything to... Like, sometimes it would just be... We found a square of wood and a pile of old bricks, and you just do a pile of bricks that creates, like, that part of the ramp. Get your square of wood, bang it on, that'll do. Jump over it. And then it kind of progressed to building all the different parts of it and finding different pieces of wood. And sometimes you then maybe move up to kind of making lots of supports throughout it. And then you'd put a little on lip so you could get onto it smoother and then off it smoother with a bit more of a jump. And I remember one of the kids, his parents like bought him an actual ramp, like a proper plastic ramp. And everyone was obsessed with it for like two weeks. And then we were like, I think we can make better ones. So we then just started using that as a blueprint to then go and make yeah. more, but like kind of take ideas from that and make more versions ourselves. Um, it, sounds, it sounds like you almost enjoyed the making of the ramp as much as, if not more, than actually skating on it. Is that one hundred percent? Like the the making was the activity. I think like the the actual riding over it. But realistically, eventually you get tired. Kids get tired easily. They've got little legs. Or someone just gets hurt. That's the creative element was the what can we make or how can we make the thing we're looking to make out of the essentially just the crap my dad had lying around in the garage. And he was like, he was a big maker of everything. So our garage was like a treasure trove for all sorts of stuff. I was all about the kind of like wood and the tools. And he had like my granddad's old tool chest, all the stuff in it. And just, we were allowed, we're basically allowed to use anything we wanted. I'm just so you had quite a lot of confidence at an early age how did you discover or you know a lot of people are told they're not creative how was that with you were you encouraged I was always told from a kid that I was I was creative actually creative wasn't the word I was told I was artistic I actually I'm not convinced that the word creative at the time was in common vernacular I don't think that it was used colloquially to describe people especially not kind of kids where I grew up kind of it, it wasn't a thing but I was told I was artistic. And I was told that that was because my dad was artistic and he was artistic because his mum was artistic. And it was kind of like, it was almost described to me as like this linear thing where like, well, either you or your sister was bound to be because your dad was and your grand was. So like, it just kind of comes down. So I was always told I was creative, which I think was probably two-sided in terms of its benefit because it had huge, it gave me lots of confidence just to do creative things, but also made me assume I wasn't very clever. So I did, like I didn't do well at school traditionally, but like I wasn't that smart. My sister was way smarter than me because she was always told she was the clever one. And I wonder whether you live into, you kind of step into the shoes you're given. Yeah. But I think that mixed with the ramp building was like, I was realizing that creativity in your thinking and then turning that into making a thing. That's how we spent all of our free time was, that was our play, that was our fun, was thinking up things that didn't exist or that we wanted that we didn't have. And they're going to go try and make them. Um, and we were never discouraged from doing it, which I think gave me the confidence that we could go and make anything. It was possible to make the things you wanted and we could work it out as we went along. And I think that combined with, look, my dad was would make everything around our house at all times and he would always let us join in. And that's just how we grew up. It meant that we had the confidence just to, to do it and just to give stuff a go. Yeah, that whole attitude of like, just give it a go, we'll figure it out. That's such an amazing gift that that he gave you because it's just it's really the creative spirit and that whole thing of you're enjoying the process. That's what kind of what I get out of that is you're in is what kids do when they when they play. And it sounds like your dad sort of had it. It's like I'm enjoying the process of doing it. The outcome will be the outcome. And I think that's to me is one of the big joys of being creative is is actually the doing of of the thing rather than necessarily and whether it comes out good or bad is kind of it's sort of like a separate piece do you do you feel that yeah definitely really nice saying if you're not prepared to be wrong you'll never create anything original it's like if you're not prepared to screw up then you'll never create anything interesting and I think that concept is really true but it's really hard to take that on if you just hear it yeah whereas I think that 
the way that we were brought up created that feeling that it was fine to go and make things. And if it wasn't good, fine. If it didn't work, then build it again. If it broke, fix it. It was kind of that, just go and do it and give it a go because it's the process of doing it is fun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And have you ever wanted to do something but felt like you're holding yourself back or worried about the outcome? Have you ever had that or do you just always feel completely fine, at ease with it? No, I definitely have that. I have that loads. I actually have it more now yeah, as an adult than I used to have. And I feel like the older I get, the more I have that feeling. I think that's a case of just kids versus grown-ups. There's a really nice kind of idea that everyone dances. People learn not to dance. So if you ask, go into a classroom of four-year-olds and say, everyone dance, all of them will start dancing, right? Because they don't know yet whether they're good or bad at dancing because no one's told them. So they just think that dancing's dance, like everyone's good at dancing because everyone can do it. So just do it. Yeah. Walk into a room of 14-year-olds and say, everyone dance. A lot of them have learned that they aren't very good at it in other people's opinions and so they're embarrassed they're scared they don't want to look silly in front of their classmates or their friends they don't want to do something they're not good at and yeah. so most of them won't do it because only the ones who are great and are confident that they are great will end up doing it and I feel like creativity but that I think works across all creativity is that the almost the older you get like find me a three-year-old who doesn't draw like every kid draws right yeah. but nearly no adults draw because yeah, yeah. at some point they've either been told or learnt that they're not good at it yeah. in someone else's opinion, so they've stopped doing it. I think that idea that you like you only do stuff you're good at, even if you love it, is kind of an annoying. Yeah. But I get I also have that. Like I can see it from a in this conversation, sensible scientific point of view, that shouldn't exist. But then in the moment, I have it all the time. Yeah, I often wonder, because I, I definitely feel that, like when I'm kind of like egging myself on to kind of start a new, like literally from a blank canvas when I'm painting, there's that feeling of like, if I've if I've been on holiday, if I haven't been in the studio for a while, it's it's worse. I feel like it's worse because I then look at what I've painted before and I'm like, who did that? I, I can't do that again. I'm just like, God, I'm just going to then disappoint myself. So it's like that fear of failure and I'm constantly having to find ways to like trick myself or to just dare myself. I heard someone say, I think they were talking about writing and they just said, right, you've got to write the worst paragraph you can possibly write. So it's like you tell yourself it's going to be bad and that's it's a way of trying to go, yeah, it's it's, it's going to be bad and it's fine. And yeah. then once you sit there and you do it, you, you kind of just end up getting better and you kind of, you get over yourself. <laughs> yeah, I totally get that. I think that it's almost... Creativity is like a muscle that you have to exercise. You've got to practice at it. You can 100% get better and worse. So I heard this concept actually explained to me about happiness, but I think applied to creativity, it works totally the same, is that everyone is in some level creative. So say, if we have to put a scale to it, say that you can be anywhere from zero to 10 creative. Everyone sits on that scale somewhere, but they don't sit at a point, they sit in a band. So you might be a five to ten creatives like at your worst you're still a five yeah. at your best you're a ten whereas someone else at their worst might be a zero and at their best be a four or a six right so which means that at your worst you're still better than them but you still have the ability to get better and worse yourself within your achievable band depending on how much you practice at it how much you kind of like exercise that muscle essentially and you can learn to be better i remember i had an art teacher at secondary school who used to preach on the fact that he believed everyone could learn to paint that it was it was in everyone like everyone did as the kids it's totally possible for you to get better and learn to a decent standard to be able to paint when i was at school i was really good at painting i'm terrible at painting now yeah. i can't have lost that ability but it's so unpracticed that it's kind of buried deep 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 down and maybe i could get back there again if i focused a bunch of time on doing it yeah yeah definitely I mean, that's partly why we're here, why this podcast exists, because I think it's really important to share those bands or the way that even people who are amazing artists or photographers or, you know, film directors, they still have the same struggles, like getting into the zone or the same kind of fears. So don't let that stop you from just having a go. Because whatever it is, you're going to kind of enjoy that process. And like you said, I think earlier, you were, you mentioned it as a tool. 
And that's what I really strongly believe is that art is a real tool. It doesn't, or, you know, creative endeavors are a real tool that whatever kind of expression you choose, it's a way of helping you to feel better or the BMX ramps example. You can see how you're connecting with others. You're presumably having loads of fun. You're out in the fresh air. There's so many things that go with it that you would have got out of that and I just think it's it's brilliant on the BMX thing do you still make them or was there any time that you use that skill again I did have a project four years ago now when I was still working at Brothers the production company and we were doing kind of like an extreme sports series of ads it was mad it was literally like seven-year-old me would have been so happy myself so we were sold that we were going to Paris for the shoot right it was like the slough of Paris we were nowhere near Paris no offence to anyone who lives in Slough. Slough's got lovely parts to it. It was a dodgy end of Paris. We were on an island in the middle of the Seine, the river, a proper little island. And on this island, there's an abandoned water park. And then a bunch, like maybe 20 or 30, kind of one to two room cabins where just a really alternative community live on this, like either full-time or part-time live on this little island, completely off grid. You can only get there via like rowing boat or speedboat, basically. There's no bridges or roadways to it, so you can't take any vehicles there. So we were using this abandoned water park as our shoot location, and one of the things we were doing there was filming this kind of world-class Red Bull-sponsored BMXer riding around this abandoned water park. So we literally would take this three-person speedboat across to it from the hotel every day. And we realised that for this scene to work we were shooting, we needed to build a ramp, but we needed a proper full-size quarter pipe for this world-class BMXer to ride. So it was it was chalk and cheese from what we used to make when I was seven. <laughs> this was like, we needed like a proper thing. But I was like, yeah, I'll make it. Like, I can do it. So I basically had 24 hours to build a full size quarter pipe with whatever materials were on the island or that we could get to the island on a speedboat. And it sounds so ridiculous, but we'd met some guys online who ran a French drone production company and they were doing the drone filming for us of this shoot. And one of them happened to have a cabin on this island that he was renovating. So he had a bunch of tools that he'd already ferried out there the months before. And as a big pile of plywood that he was going to build the house out of, essentially. So we just bought some of this wood off him and borrowed his tools and a bunch of screws. And I literally went on YouTube and was like, how would you build a quarter pipe? Watched the video for 20 minutes. And then me and one of the other guys were like, yeah, we reckon we could do that. Everyone else go off and do the rest of whatever prep you need to do we'll spend the next day building this ramp. And we did. We built a really legit, decent quarter pipe. World-class BMX was very happy with it. We then disassembled it, rebuilt it in this abandoned water park, and then dirtied it up. I then graffitied it to kind of make it look like it had always been there because this whole water park graffitied, so it kind of had to look like it was always part of the part of the scene. And then we shot with it, and it was perfect. Like It worked really well. The guy nearly hit his head on the ceiling because we made it quite big, but oh. it was pretty, honestly, it was that whole week was like, being paid to do what I spent my entire childhood doing for free. It was amazing. Oh God, I absolutely love that story. I just, I love the way it comes full circle and I love the kind of shenanigans around like, and how <laughs> the coincidence of you found that guy and he was renovating something that was brilliant. Bloody lucky. Like there was zero planning involved. It just all, all worked out. I know, I know. God, it's yeah, it's brilliant. And if you've got a photo, then I'll share that in the show notes if anyone wants to see the half pipe that Adam made. Yeah, I've got, we've got a bunch of photos from that shoot, so I'll, I'll send some over. Oh, bro. Right. So that brings me on to the next question, really, which is what triggers you to create? The best way I can describe it is I think I get like an itchiness, like a restlessness when I just have to I have to go and make something. I actually heard a really good analogy that really resonated with me this morning which was a new episode of Diary of the CEO with Stephen Bartlett and he was interviewing Will I Am, and they had like a big conversation around cre- creativity. And Will I Am had this metaphor that he feels that he's like a sponge. So he spends a lot of his time soaking up creative influence and impulse from all sorts of different places and ideas and thoughts and all this stuff from all around the world. And like a sponge, when a sponge gets to a certain level of water density, it can't accept any more in until it's ringed out and emptied. And for him, that process of wringing the sponge out and emptying it of water is him creating something. So each time he's wringing out his sponge, that's him making something. Yeah. So what's your point earlier about, do you worry about whether it's good or not? His point was, it's irrelevant to me whether it's good or not. I absolutely have to bring out my sponge. Otherwise there's gonna be, you know, I can't take anything else in and there's all these things kind of crashing down the door trying to get into my brain. Um, and that really resonated with me, the idea that like, I often feel like I just, I get to a stage where I'm like, I just have to make something. Yeah. I'm kind of 
I get this restlessness that I'm kind of like, oh, I've just seen all these ideas. I've got these things flying around my head. And I just want to make one of them. I want one of them. I want to do one of them now. The problem is I have is that sometimes I let it go on too long. So then kind of that, the feeling of needing to do it gets so much. I literally go like, right, I'm doing something right now. I'm going to go make something. And I find the feeling so overwhelming that I'll just go make anything as fast as possible to try and get rid of the feeling. And it always ends up being like shit, like a proper shit bodge that then makes it feel worse because I'm like, oh, I'm crap. I made a crap thing. Am I any good at creative stuff? I, how annoying is that? So I try to have like a, almost like a pipeline of things that I'm always working on a few things at once so that one, if I've got lots of kind of projects on, it's easy for me throughout any day just to kind of dip in a little bit to one. So I'm always wringing out that sponge a little bit. Yeah. Not kind of fully, but like always doing a bit of a reset, as it were. So I can always keep that feeling at bay, I guess. The problem I find, though, is if I, if a project goes on too long, I then just, I'm over it and I hate it. And I'm like, oh, this is like, I'm bored of it now. It's been going too long. I just want it finished. Just yeah. almost like off my desk, because it becomes like a to-do list thing. I'm like, right, get off my desk. You're not, you're not helping anymore. You're not fun. Just get it done. Yeah. And yeah, I really relate to that sponge analogy as well. And and the thing of like, you kind of like start a creative project, like, woohoo, this is going to be great. You know? And then it's like, oh God. And then like, at the other end, you're like, okay, it's pretty good. But you know, you kind of then want your next fix or that's how I feel. I'm like, right, I want to go on to the next one. So yeah. then you've got like a pipeline of different things bubbling away. Are these like personal projects? And, and how do you get your inspiration for all these different creative or artistic expressions? Yeah, all... Or all personal project stuff that is mainly a stuff around my house, either like jobs that need doing to, we're, we're renovating a 250 year old house. So there's literally always something to do. I cannot create off a blank page. I'm terrible at it. So like to start a project, I need constraints and then reference material because the, almost for me, the options are endless and that just blows my mind every time. I'm like, no, can't pick one. Don't know what to do. Like I need someone start for me and then I'll, finish it or kind of someone pick for me and then I'll go and make it but the actual process because I always start a project with reference so often I just go on Pinterest to be honest it's great for it and just find the stuff I like and then pick one and I'm making that the problem is there's so much on there yeah that I'll end up picking 10 I like but I need one of them and that becomes a really tricky process of like how do I whittle it down and yeah but that's a good like almost creative prompt because I've heard that so many times that actually you need that kind of parameter like when I paint I don't have endless amounts of colors I have a very fixed palette because even with those what eight colors I can mix far too many but I mean there's so many choices like thousands of choices in one piece of work that you have to limit it so I think that I think that's really useful for people to go actually just choose something really simple as a good starting point, as a way in. I find it I find it so much easier to create when there actually is a client and a deadline and a problem you're solving because it like the constraints. There's a t-shirt and jacket company called Painter who make amazing clothes. I've got a nice badge from them that says on the badge, constraints make you interesting. And I really like I believe in that. I really think that constraints in the creative process make things better. I need the kind of the starting point, the reference, the brief, so that I can then use that as a way of narrowing possibilities yeah definitely because I think I think there is a bit of a misconception of oh you're creative and you kind of like would go around thinking of random stuff and it's all really random but actually it kind of because of the fear and all of the kind of wrangling that happens when you're trying to create something I think you sort of need you need that you need to add some kind of sharp points in somewhere so you kind of narrow it down and then you can get that kind of momentum like that oomph to get you into the you know over the line to be able to either start keep going or or finish it so I I totally relate to that I think it's really useful for people for us to talk about that it's a bit of direction isn't it like I think in like you without knowing some level of like a we're going that way in whatever that way is you end up just floating around and I really need that yeah Um, definitely yeah because I think that's important isn't it you know your style of creativity your way in is to start with something and then adapt it and build on it shape it how you want it whereas other people might be okay with starting from a relatively blank canvas and then find something that they want to do it's almost I'm a big fan of the creative brief so when I used yeah. to do marketing I was always like right the brief is like golden and make sure you're really clear with what you're asking like a creative agency to do for example 
Um, and I still find myself almost briefing myself now because I have to have those parameters. So I, yeah, I completely relate to that. That's a really nice idea. I like that. I might take that idea of like, if it's a self project, actually brief yourself. Do you yeah. do it like a physical, like, would you write it down? How do you do it? Yeah, sometimes I do write it down. Just to, I find that writing has been really strong for me in terms of like clearing through a creative block. So I go through this thing of, it's almost like, I just I, I get really kind of tense and in my head, like you were describing. I know there's something about to almost be born, but I can't articulate it. And so I get really grumpy for a couple of days. Then I remember that I need to write and then I write it down until literally like, you know, Julia Cameron in the artist way, the book that basically the main thing is like she talks about morning pages and how you should write three pages and she does it for different reasons. But essentially I took the nugget of that and was like, right, I'm just going to write and write and write until it suddenly reveals itself. And so I kind of write to clear it and then through writing it, I've almost basically created my own brief and I go from there. Sometimes I do it handwritten. Sometimes I I write on the computer. But there's been times when I think I'm writing a blog post and actually I've written a brief. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So it sort of comes out really, but I highly recommend writing just for and not knowing where it's going to go, just writing. It really helps. Yeah, I think that's a really cool idea. That kind of, it's a way of getting your thoughts out on paper. There's some concept about the reason it's good to say things out loud and not just think them. So the reason that therapy works to some extent or just talking to a friend is because the part of your brain that hears your internal monologue is different to the part of your brain that hears sound. So if you think something versus if you, even if you're just in a room on your own and say that out loud, a different part of your brain receives that information. So there's different parts of your brain then working on that information. I feel like that same concept to some extent maybe works when you write things down and therefore by getting that brief out of your head onto a piece of paper, it's not just this thought of, oh, I'm going to go and make a whatever. It's actually, here's, like, I've really had to think about it. I've had to focus my thoughts and write them down. Because often, you know, we, you know, it's like when you think about anything, other thoughts jump in, in the way and you kind of scramble off in one direction, another direction. And it's really hard to think very clearly without recording that thought in some way. Yeah, definitely. Maybe like the writing it down is part of the process of learning what you actually want. Yeah. And I, I love that whole thing about the difference in your head. And then when you say it out loud, the different parts of the brain. I, when I was like working in the world of business, I would always have certain people, a couple of people who I would call up and go, can I just talk things through with you a minute, just because I'm really grappling with this and I just can't quite get clear. And I think that's probably what I was trying to do. And that's probably why the writing really helps me because and the mo- it doesn't well, I can't call someone up and go yeah I'm just thinking I mean I subvert fairy tales so like calling someone up and like talking to them about a fairy tale they're just like what are you what are you on they've got no point of reference there so but writing it down helps massively for me to kind of choose how I'm going to do it I think that's a really interesting point as a, a maybe a good one for people trying to get into being creative as well like if people if some people don't think they're creative or they're you know, not creative enough they're trying to pr- you know, exercise that muscle of creativity actually recording it in some and like whatever you would know if, if you're if you like writing write it down if you like talking then voice note yourself whatever it is the you know type on your phone whatever like some kind of level of recording an idea if you like images then collect a bunch of images from pinterest and instagram and magazines or whatever and like scrapbook them like whatever your way is of getting the idea out of your head onto a piece of paper so you can look at it again and go yeah that's the thing that that's the thing i need that's what i'm looking for that is right or maybe actually it's not quite right i'm going to tweak this tweak that that's quite a nice way of flexing that muscle of creativity yeah i'm a massive voice note i think that's such a useful thing and also like the notes app and I was listening to a podcast. It was an interview with Rishi Kesh Hirwe, who's the the creator of Song Exploder, one of my favourite podcasts. And he was saying if he was to cr- choose any kind of creative tools that he would hold up as as like really important to to this century, it is the Notes app and the Voice Note because they capture creativity or artistic inspiration in the moment. You don't have to set up any equipment, and because it's so fleeting, those moments of like. <gasps> capture it you know it they're, they're there and they're gone and if you don't capture it then and there I often find that you you know you, you just got to do it I often pull over the side of the road I'm like right got to write that down or got to, got to record that exactly I'm exactly the same although I don't pull over sorry <laughs> I, should, I should pull over 
relationship, but hopefully just a voice note. There. Don't tell the police. <laughs> yeah, I, so I use the notes app mainly on my phone. So it's about six years since I started doing it. And any idea I get, I just put in there. Whether it's kind of an idea for a business, an idea for a project, a creative thing, it's just like chuck in this one thing. And it's literally, it's called ideas. So I've got ideas, one, two, three, and four notes that is just, and it's a monologue and it's mainly recorded. And maybe there's a thing about like, you know, that when you're in a shower, you come up with your ideas. Like I find it when I'm driving or I'm out walking or running, yep. like doing something else that's moving, but mindless. Yeah. And that allows another part of my brain to start thinking about and processing stuff. That's when all the, all the ideas come to me. So they're always recorded with the voice recorder thing that kind of voice to type. So <laughs> when I read them back, they're always like, they make no sense because it's whatever my phone's interpretation of what I was trying to shout at it was in whatever noisy environment I was doing it in. So they always take a bit of translating and remembering what the hell I was on about. Like, I love that. Just like, just a monologue, just like, like just dump all the ideas in there and go back to them as and when and see, see what we can. Like, same with, that's like Pinterest is great. Like, I have a, a board on my Pinterest that's just called cool stuff that I'm just kind of like, anything I see, there's almost no point to it. It's just anything that I like, where I see it in real life, I sit online, screenshot, I take a photo, stick it in that, just so I know I've got them all in one place for the future. Like, if I ever like, oh, what was that thing? Yeah, but what you do end up doing by doing that is you end up having a picture of your taste. So there's that discernment that you kind of, yeah, you're looking for stuff. But actually, it's a really useful, I, I know visual artists who do this as an exercise. There's like, if you kind of like, I don't know, creatively blocked about what you're going to paint next, and they will kind of go on this like rampage through Pinterest, <laughs> gather it all up, and then they're like, "Oh, what's the commonalities?" And and you do notice, oh, I tend to be going for the color red, or there's some gold twists in this, or you know, the theme might be of butterflies coming through, or whatever it might be. You you just gradually start to see some kind of theme, and it talks back to you. That's a really cool. I've never thought about doing it. Well, I like that rampage idea. That's really cool. I, I do it kind of slowly throughout all the time. But that idea of kind of like, I need to start a project. I need somewhere to start. I need some reference. And then going on a reference rampage. That's a really, I love that idea. That's a really cool concept. Also reference rampage. Love a bit of alliteration. That's nice. Love it. I had a lecturer at uni called Jerry Leonardis. And one of the things he told us was that we had to be like squirrels. And his idea is that a squirrel spends their life collecting nuts and hiding them away for a rainy day basically for a time they'll need them and he says that we need to be like the kind of creative squirrel so we need to basically need to be open to seeing these creative nuts so like wherever whatever situation you're in you need to be aware that there is reference you could be taking in and absorbing you need to always be looking for those things and then storing them away somewhere for when you need reference What has creating things, what has it taught you about yourself? I think the, probably the biggest thing is that I've realised that I'm a very empathetic person. I feel like empathy allows me to feel lots of other people's emotions and ideas and thoughts towards stuff and then take that in as reference as well. And then on the flip side of it, like really helps me to understand how people will react to something I make. So I find it very easy to put myself in lots of other people's shoes. And from a creative point of view, that you know, changes the things I make or how I make things. Yeah. Also because I cry at basically every film in the world. I'm, I'm there with you. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I do think that there's an element of some people are really thick skinned, but I think when you are using your creativity, there's an element that you, you do have to let things through. And I've often wondered in the last couple of years, is creativity a way that you can kind of flip between those two states that is really healing? Because, okay, you might have to be quite thick skinned for your job, but then if you kind of flex that muscle of creativity, it might help you to get better balance. Because the problem with me is I let the creative element go completely. And that was to the detriment of my own health, which I would never do again. And that's, again, why I think it's really useful to kind of help people to understand how they can try little bits of it. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really interesting point. Can you tell me about a time when creativity helped heal you or bring you clarity? The most obvious one, the most recent one has been this year for me. So my mum died just before Christmas. I'd already lost my dad five years ago. My brother-in-law died a couple of years ago. So I kind of had a lot, a lot of kind of deep sadness with our family. And when my mum died end of last year, I just hit like complete burnout. Like it just, it, it was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back kind of thing. Like it floored me. And... It wasn't because of like a lack of creative. I had a creative job. Right? I was a film producer. I spent 
all day every day creating stuff whether it's creative problem solving or actually going out and making films but I just was com- like I kind of I ran out a com- complete burnout I kind of just lost my like I wasn't myself anymore at the start of this year I didn't have the mental capacity to create to think to, like I forgot what food I liked eating and how to cook those things and what I enjoyed and how I liked spending my time and so I kind of so I stepped down from my company and just decided to take some extended time off to rebuild myself and to kind of to heal basically and try and get back to where I used to like, get back to the me I used to be or I mean that's that's a whole different conversation actually because I think there's I think when someone dies you change permanently so it's impossible to get back to who you used to be I wanted to be as close as possible back to where I was before basically whilst understanding that my world was very different and a big part of how I did that was through creativity and I did it through like doing work around my house and just like lots of woodwork but I really enjoy woodwork as you've probably gathered and I really find woodwork in itself very cathartic as a process I think it's quite slow it's very kind of like insular like I do it on my own I'm in kind of in my garage listen to a podcast listen to some music and just kind of go at it for hours on end and I find that kind of a very relaxing cathartic process and lots of the elements of woodworking are actually just quite monotonous tasks which I find quite relaxing and that's kind of that's really helped me this year is just spending some time just on my own making stuff and really what the way it helped is because I was processing thoughts right so it it was this for the same reason that you have ideas in the shower because you're doing a mindless task that allows your brain to do something else or when you when you go for a run or go for a drive because you're doing something that allows a different part of your brain to start processing other thoughts that are going on. It did the exact same thing for me. So I was doing, at times, long, mindless tasks, like sanding, for example. I might have eight hours of sanding to do. That's just kind of a mindless back-and-forth task, which is enough of a, of a distraction for a certain part of my brain that a different part of my brain could then start working on the problems I had and start thinking through and processing my mum's death. And that that really, really helped me this year to kind of get back to to being me. That and like some exercise and a healthy diet, which I was also massively lacking, both of. Yeah, no, I love that story. And I'm so sorry to hear about your loss with your mum and think your dad and your brother and all. That's really, really terrible run of events. I totally relate to that monotony of making. Like there's certain bits of painting, like, I don't know, hair or sometimes the background or something that's just like a big swathe of night sky or whatever it is and it's not like painting the eyes or something it's actually you're just it's a bit mindless and I love that bit as well there's certain bits where I just don't listen to podcasts or anything and that's when you do you can get those thoughts and there's just something about seeing it unfold in front of you and I really like the way that you talked about it in the context of also eating well and exercise because I do think that we often talk a lot about the importance of wellness and eating well, exercise, like the common things that you would say when people aren't well. There's obviously art therapy, but I think just that general accessible making things around the home or doing a little project, it doesn't have to be specifically art or anything that sounds a little bit like it's got a barrier between you and and it. I think that's just a really helpful way of adding that into the mix of helping you feel well. Yeah, I, I also think that the word art and creativity are kind of inextricably linked, right? But they're they're actually really different things. Like, art is one form of creativity, but it's, like, I think incorrectly often used interchangeably, almost. And I think creativity has the ability to be a real good healer for everyone to help you get into that process of thinking and processing your thoughts. Anyone can be creative, it's more kind of how you use that to then help yourself. Yeah. Once you understand that there are benefits to be had, it's like, well, why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you? Yeah. What, what's the, the no one's going to like, you don't have to get into like some kind of art gallery or be up for some kind of award. It's just back to enjoying the process and, and what you get out of the process. So, yeah. I will I'd happily say that. And I'm so hypocritical because at the same time, I'm continually worried about, am I any good? Is this any good? Is the thing I'm making any good? Or is that idea any good? The downside of the internet is that you can see everyone else's creativity, right? And you can see how much better everyone else is than you. And that really sucks because like, I'm never going to be the best 
creative in literally any field that I try and go for, I'm not going to be best because there's 8 billion other people giving it a go as well. Exactly. And remembering that people who are sharing stuff on social media, they're showing the best of what they've done. It's not V1. Yeah, it's not V1 where you see the whole messy. I mean, let's get let's be honest. It is a total mess, like creating stuff. It is messy. I think it's a massive misconception that like the best creative people just have an idea and then they do it. But first time they nailed it, first time done. Everyone who's good makes shit work and probably makes more shit work than they make good work because the process of creativity is keeping making shit stuff until you accidentally make a good thing and I go, oh, I meant to do that. And then show it. <laughs> like, that's, that's the process, right? If the thing you made is bad, it's just not finished, yeah. right? It's yeah. just, it's an iteration towards the next thing, right? Yeah, exactly. That's the process. It's iteration. I guess what we're saying is the important nugget is you've just got to be up for it. You've got to just throw yourself into it and just be up for it. And there's a constant grapple between wanting it to be really good and then enjoying the process, but just being willing to give it a go. There's that beautiful cliche of it's the, it's the journey, not the destination. So I love a cliche. The reason I love a cliche is that the definition of a cliche, this might not be the Oxford definition, it's the pub definition, but the definition of a cliche is that it's something that's so true, it's been said so many times, it's kind of embarrassing, awkward and stupid that we still haven't remembered it. That's what a cliche is, right? So like if you if you take that definition and apply it to any common cliche, it works. And it's the journey, not the destination, is a great example of those. Because there's almost no one who disagrees with that. Yeah, it's still a horrible cliche bumper sticker. And speaking of the journey, we're now ready <laughs> to get to your second creation. So can you share what your second creation is, please? Yes, I can. All right, so it's the films How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days and What Women Want. And they are my collective creation too, which as a collective are... Films about men in advertising. Brilliant, brilliant. It's funny because my first ever proper job was for Revlon Cosmetics. Mm. Revlon Cosmetics were one of the companies that sponsored How to Lose a Guy in 10 Really? I went to the premiere in London. (laughs) I love that. Completely random. (laughs) That's fantastic. I had a connection to that film. That's brilliant. Yeah, so the, the reason that those are my number two is that the main memory of both those films was thinking, I could do that job. That looks really fun and I reckon I'd be good at that. And for me, advertising and marketing, when I saw those films, I was like, that's kind of the intersection of the two things I'm good at at school, is art and economics. It was this uh, realisation, like this huge realisation, almost like in a what women want lightning bolt kind of fashion. Like, I could do that job. And I really believe in that concept of you can't see it, you can't be it. So I didn't know that those jobs existed as a kid. My dad was a dentist, my mum was a doctor. Everyone else in my family was teachers. The kind of traditional stuff. So... Those two films were the first times that I learned that creative jobs existed that weren't like being a movie star or being a singer. So I think they had this like just massive impact on my life where I was like, maybe I should do that. Like maybe I should spend my life doing that. And I then fa- actually found out about a year after that that my best friend's dad actually owned a marketing agency. I had no idea because my friend didn't know what his dad did. And I was like, oh, look, an adult who... I know who's real, who does a job that's a bit like the people in those films do. And then it all started kind of coming together for me that that was a, a thing that was possible and a route that was possible. I took a really non-direct wiggly way of getting there. But that really is why I ended up working in in the kind of wider marketing, advertising, creative industries, because those two films showed me they existed. And they made it look really fun as well. Can you explain that wiggly path then that you mentioned? So although I'd kind of discovered this marketing jobs I still in my mind thought that the way of having a creative job for me was probably gonna be being an artist so I spent all my time painting and I kind of figured that I'd just go to goldsmiths do a degree in painting and then become a painter that would be my job so I got myself some work experience with Damien Hurst which was an absolute coup I was probably 16 maybe and I went to my cousin's wedding and her maid of honor was his receptionist or something ridiculous or his PA I, was, I guess I must be a very confident 16-year-old. So I literally went up to the bar and I was like, I heard you work at Damon Hurst. I'd like to get some work experience, please. And amazingly, she agreed to it. And she was like, yeah, email me after the wedding. Like, we'll see what we can do. And I did, and I did, and it worked. So I did two or three weeks working in Vauxhall at Damon Hurst's gallery, studio, basically. And it blew my mind that he didn't do any bloody painting at all. So he basically believes in concept over craft. So like he believes that the idea is the most important thing and actually how it gets put together is kind of irrelevant. And it turns out, actually, like so many of the great painters of 
the last multiple hundreds of years weren't doing all their own paintings like da vinci wouldn't be you were saying earlier about like painting the hair is way more boring than painting the eyes like they wouldn't paint the backgrounds they've got an apprentice for that shit it's boring they'd paint like the good bits damon hurst basically took that concept to an extreme so i was in this studio with 10 15 other graduate artists who in varying levels of ability and skill and seniority would create his paintings for him and he'd come along at the end maybe do a few little bits that he really liked doing a touch up and then stick a signature on it out the door sell it and it blew my mind that like one this was the first time i'd seen like firsthand like commercial creativity but and to me that like, damon hurst was an idol of mine at the time like i did my whole gcc thesis on him i loved his style i loved his painting everything and to see how he was creating was really interesting and it was like a team sport right it wasn't just him locked away in a room painting days on day it's like he was barely ever there. I only met him three times. And that kind of really opened my eyes. So I then, for the rest of my time at school, I changed to trying to create like him. So I kind of got this idea in my head that it was all about just like smashing stuff out. So by the time we got to the end of school, I was like banging out like four flower paintings a weekend, sticking in the gallery, trying to sell them. My thought process was all around the commerciality of it. And it eventually ended up ruining painting for me because I wasn't doing it anymore because I loved doing it. I was doing it just to smash another one out to try and sell it because I thought that's what being an artist was. So I kind of, then I really fell out of love with art entirely. So then I decided to lean into the business side of things instead. So then I got a job as an estate agent. Loved it for a couple of years until I realised there was no creativity in my life anymore. And I'd lost all of that creative input or excitement. That's stuff that I actually loved doing. I'd just forgotten I loved it because I'd lost my way a little bit. So I decided I was going to quit this job and go and do graphic design at uni. I basically remembered those films and I was like, oh, let's get back like back into that creative industry, advertising, marketing, let's go there. Because I'd realised that I preferred the business mix of it. And that's where kind of marketing ended up being like that perfect middle ground for me. It's like it is the mix of sales and creative, basically. And I wonder, like, because there is that difference between creating things for your own personal projects, but then that commercial creativity. What is it about commercial creativity that still seems to light you up i think that for me the commercial side of it those are the restraints right the idea of starting like go make a film i'm like well why what about when how and that for me is terrifying for some people that's like is exactly what they want it's what like they live for that like that would be the, the dream brief and spend their entire life trying to find it for me it's i hate that like i i can't operate in that environment I've always said it's because I'm not good enough. Like, I'm not creative enough to be able to do that. For me, that is a like a heightened level of creativity that I don't have, that other people do have. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if that's being too harsh on myself, where it's just different styles of creativity as opposed to a, a scale from good to bad. I'm not sure. But the reason I like commercial creativity, like kind of working within a commercial environment, is because it is those constraints. It's the It's the rules you have to follow. Whether those constraints are budget, brief, the thing that they want you to make, to sell something timeline which was yesterday like the all those things like all those constraints for me create elements on that blank page that are a starting block for me to go from yeah yeah i can see um, i think it's interesting though that you still return to your woodworking and you still do creative things at home there was a quote again from rishi Kesh hereway that i heard the other day and it was just really succinct and really nice and it just said art is for me design is for them and I just really like that because I was like, actually, yeah. And again, art in the loosest possible sense. But essentially, there's, there's, a, there's a personal version and then there's one that you do to an official brief that's for them. And you kind of, with the design element, you're compromising some of your own artistic license or sometimes a lot of it. But there's still something, you're still creating something. You can still point at it and go, me and, and the team probably made that. Um, yeah, yeah I, I really agree with that. I think that's I really like that phrase is really nice that yeah. design for me like so I always define design as problem solving and you're right in that using your that kind of phrasing is that kind of design is for them it's because they've come whoever they is they've come with a problem to solve yeah. so you've designed a solution whether that solution is a film or a poster or a piece of software whatever it's like you've created a, a solution to their problem whereas the art element is that again the art could be a painting or a piece of music but like the art is the i did it for me because i had to let it out mm -hmm. if you happen to like it and that makes me money brilliant but but i mean i don't i'm not a musician i don't know i doubt there's a lot of songs are created 
off the back of a record label going, we've got a brief for you. We want a song that is liked by girls and boys from the age of 14 to 24. We'd like it to be up to a maximum of two and a half minutes. We want it to be piano and guitar. And we want it by Friday. Like, I don't think that's how music's made. It's probably the difference between like Pop Idol or like, <laughs> you know, well, it's called manufactured bands, isn't it? Especially like in the 90s, that was classic. Whereas you've got then like the rawness of music making and the kind of ups and downs of, of all of that process, which is messier, really. The the manufactured is like the sanitised version, which there's something that get, gets lost in that, for me anyway, personally, it's so sanitized that you lose the feeling. Yeah. There's this concept in filmmaking of the director's cut. It's basically like, this is what I wanted to make. From from a creative point of view, this is what I think this should be. Whereas the thing that comes out ends up being the thing that the people paying for it wanted to help sell whatever it is they were trying to sell, which is the reason they made you make the thing in the first place. Yeah. And neither is wrong, right? They're just both from almost from different briefs. Yeah, exactly. And I saw that in my career like you see like the wranglings between creative directors and marketeers and and it's just like and it's what success looks like to the different individuals so what success yes looks like to the client and then what it looks like to when, when they get into like the creative juices flowing of their creative vision is not necessarily going to be able to be realized and simultaneously fulfill the brief of the the client so I think that that's where you get tension. I, I can think of an example where I would imagine it's probably a bit closer together at like a Christmas ad where, you know, the classic John Lewis Christmas ad or something like that, where there's much more inbuilt emotion naturally. They're not trying to, they're obviously trying to sell something eventually, but it's not necessarily the primary takeout from the from the creative execution. Yeah, that, do you know what, I've never thought about it. That's a really interesting I think that's a really is a good example. I'm like, I'm sure I'm sure there is a director's cut of every Christmas I'd ever made. Oh yeah. Because which director doesn't want to have the best version of it? Yeah. I liked your idea that it was actually it's that kind of like mis- it's just a misalignment of expectations, right? It's the what does your version of success look like in the director's cut? The success of the director is the artistically most creative thing, whereas success for the brand is does it sell the most whatever it is you're trying to sell? Not always. A lot of like ad content and films are made to push a brand along which isn't necessarily about directly selling something but even within that you still get that same yeah because the brand's trying to connect to the brand's kind of truth or essence or what it's trying like you say propelling that brand along and like having certain associations with the brand whereas then you've got the director's cut which has probably gone deep into a human truth and wants to kind of mine that creativity harder but it doesn't necessarily connect back up to the brand. So I think it's, it's working at like, it's almost like working at different levels of of depth. Yeah. I think this, like that concept happens across all like commercial creativity, right? Yeah. That's why you need things like director's cut. So you can then be like, well, yeah, this is back to what we talked about earlier about kind of needing the creative expression. Like it's a, a release of their ideas. It's kind of wanting to get their thoughts into the world. Sometimes you have to make a director's cut to show what you wanted out of it and to get what you needed out of it almost. Yeah, yeah, no, I love that. Yeah, definitely to get what you needed out of it. It's like you've just got to express that part. And that's hard to do in a 30-second ad. Like, <laughs> so there's got to be some kind of choices made. So, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it's a good idea to have director's cuts because then it kind of feels like then you, everybody does get what they need. Right, this takes us on to the third and final creation, Adam. So can you share your third creation, please? Yes, I can. And in exact contradiction to what we were just talking about, this was a film project that I did work on that we didn't do a director's cut of because the brand gave us so much freedom, they literally let us do whatever we wanted. So the thing we made was the director's cut, which is great. This is actually for Salcan, the bag company that I showed the bag of at the start. So we basically, because when I was at Brother, worked in the same building as the guys around Salcan, became good friends with them and decided that it would be really fun to make them an ad. So we kind of we went to them and said, we'd like to make you an ad. Would you would you like one? Please let us make it. We'll create the budget between us and we'll put all our time in for free. You guys put your time in and let's just make make a cool thing. And they loved the idea and we had complete creative freedom. So we can then make a thing that we're so proud of. We can then take it to lots of other companies as a reference film to be like, look, we've made this. This is how good we are. Would you like us to make one for you? We'll have a bunch of fun and then they'll get an ad that a company their size wouldn't normally have to afford 
everyone wins. And it was just an incredible project. We had the most amazing team on it. Like everyone was brilliant and so much fun and so nice and like creates just such a nice environment for the week. They had an old VW transporter camper van, like a 1987 camper that was like painted up in their brand colours. The thing they drove to like trade shows and to fairs and stuff to like sell the bags out of. Brilliant. Let's make a film around that. Let's drive it to Wales, to just beautiful countryside and just have a great week in the outdoors. We all love the outdoors. We all love creating things on almost on the fly and like not loads of planning. And just go make this amazing thing. So we basically did like a deep dive into van life. What's happening in the world of van life and camping and people living out of transport, all that kind of stuff. And this one thing we kept seeing was people taking these shots out of the back of their transport with a boot open, legs in shot, like, look how nice my breakfast spot is, look how nice my camping spot is, look at the sea, like whatever it was, it was like that shot kind of like out the back doors over just whatever beautiful scenario they're in. Basically, you know, everyone's selling the life of come and live in a van like we do. And we just really liked that. We love that, like, that visual of like, brilliant. We can really tap into that community if we speak in their same visual language. So we then had the idea of, well, let's take a film camera, literally bolt it to the floor of this van. So the guys installed a wooden floor, like a plywood floor into the van. So we could then screw into it. So we screwed a tribe onto it, fixed the camera. We're like, right, we won't touch the camera for the entire week. Brilliant benefits of that makes our job so much easier. We're not going to dick about with all the stuff that slows you down the shoots with all the kind of settings and finding the right angles and all this kind of stuff. Like, well, the camera can't move. We're not allowed to move it. And like we were saying earlier, like constraints, right? Fix the camera. We'll get two actors to come and play the roles of a couple on a holiday. Now let's just go on this holiday with them, right? In this van, a couple of follow cars to fit the rest of the people on the rest of the kit in it. And let's just go and have a really, really fun week away in Wales as if we are just like fly on the wall of this couple on a camping holiday. We'll subtly interject the bags into some of these scenes, but not like, it's not be too much in your face. We're going to be filming them having fun. We're going to sell the lifestyle of living out of a camper. One of the things you need in that scenario is a bag. The bag will be involved occasionally. And the reason it's here is because it's it, the film I'm most proud of, having like, of everything, you know, probably the thousands of films over the, kind of my time, a brother in production. And this is the one I'm most proud of. It was the most fun to make. The team was incredible. Locations were incredible. The thing we made at the end was brilliant. Like, it was one of the best things we've ever made as a, as a commercially successful ad, it's really successful. It's done a really good job for them. And it's one of the things that gets, you know, we've found we get the most comments off it. People kind of emailing in or texting us or getting in touch on Instagram saying like, saw this, this thing was great. Can you make us one? And the brand loved it. And, you know, years later, they're still using kind of bits of content from that shoot as their ongoing campaigns because it just, it works really well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just, I, I absolutely loved it. I had basically I had the best time in a really nice camping holiday with my mates. We made a really good ad out of it and it's one of the best bits of work we've ever done. And it was like a proper ticked every box thing. Yeah, it's brilliant. Obviously all the creations will be in the in the show notes so you'll be able to watch the video, but it's so well done. And I'm really glad you explained how you did the camera because I was like watching it going, it doesn't move. And that, now I know why, because <laughs> you literally screwed it or bolted it. It was screwed to the floor. And then the two guys who own Salcan cooked for us the entire week. They were like chalet hosts for the entire week. Because, again, money saving, let's throw that in the pot. Everyone's going to be working 14 hour days and going to be hungry all the time. And they were just incredible hosts for the, the week. We then gave ourselves a constraint of the camera not moving, which is the best thing we did, right? Because it, the whole success of that film is based off this one fixed angle. That's why it's so good. But that constraint meant that we had to be really creative in what we were doing. We were trying to show a wide variety of outdoor activities and outdoor fun, but you never leave the van. So if our if our point of view never leaves the van, how do we show lake swimming and mountain biking and camping and surfing and all these different things like hiking? And that constraint was really good because we ended up coming up all the, like hundreds of mini scenes. And there's a lot in there and there's a lot more that didn't make it in. What we created were these mini scenes of the start and or end of an activity. So you you get to see them do the thing through the little moments of respite or pause or set up or pack down of the activity itself we're really lucky with locations and the guy we had working with us was our local fixer to find all these different spots where you actually could see them go paddle boarding because find a spot where we could park the van you could see down the river so actually you could see them kind of paddle off down the river in the distance but really the whole film was about 
you as the viewer fill in the gaps and you just get to see these teeny little moments of the start and end of all these activities and you can fill in the gaps yourself and it yeah it, that kind of restraint worked really well yeah no it's really good and it com- it comes across it's a really great film i definitely recommend people watch it so i guess that brings me to one of the last questions adam which is yes. what would happen if i said to you that you need to stop creating how would you feel what would you lose <sighs> well that's hard the reason i do create stuff is because i don't feel like there's any other option like i feel like i absolutely have to create stuff otherwise i get this like unbearable eventually unbearable restlessness i don't know how i'd survive without creating stuff and with, like i think creativity can be anything like from making a physical thing to just having an idea right so i don't know how you're going to stop me from making stuff because you can tie my hands but you can't stop me thinking but it's yeah i I don't without being unnecessarily dramatic i honestly don't know how i'd go about living in the world well i think it's just an element of like it sustains you and i i completely understand that because it's a way of life but also it kind of nourishes you and it helps you to feel alive helps you feel fully alive and without it you know, I definitely don't function well. And I know I need to eat well, I need to go for a run each week. And if I don't have certain types of things, sleep well, it's just one of those things that I feel like I have to do. And it sounds like it's quite similar. From your yeah, point. I, I honestly think I go mad. Like, it's, for me, it's like it's part of a healthy diet. Yeah, it's a nice thing about it. like, it's a, if your, your body and your mind need certain things, like you just said, to create a healthy life. And for me, creativity is just one of those ingredients that I need to have a, a healthy, happy life. Brilliant. So I'd like to say congratulations, Adam. You have made it through the forest. You've illuminated the pathway all the way to the end. So I can now confirm that you are an Art After Dark Illuminati. So woo! <laughs> Do I get a badge? Yeah, I'll go, I'll go and whip one up, actually. That's a good Thank idea. So, yeah, I'll stick it on my bag. A good brief, yeah, yeah next to the caribbean <laughs> <laughs> so as such there are two duties that you have to fulfill before we end the podcast the yeah first one is to help people to understand how can they just get a little taste of the creativity that you really enjoy and then the second one is have you got any guests that you would recommend that i speak to who would be willing to come and share their stories with me in the forest okay amazing so how could you experience creativity the thing that i enjoy at the moment a lot is woodworking so i have two project ideas that i think if anyone wants to get into woodworking then two good options for that are either making a welly boot hook or a bath tray which i appreciate sounds weird no, but I, think I, I feel like i need both of those things they're both essentially super easy to make they're just one plank of wood is the reality that's why i think it's a great starting project a bath tray can be as simple as one piece of wood this is after the bath done so if you get a rectangle of wood that's the width of your bath or wider you've now got a bath tray you can then make it slightly better by stopping it from falling out by putting some stoppers on it so if you put the stoppers just on the inside of where it would sit in your bath then it can't go too far left and can't go too far right because it's got stoppers that will stop it from falling off the edge that that's as simple as well it's one rectangle of wood with two little rectangles underneath it to stop it going left and right done do it out of an old bit of scrap because one if it goes wrong, you won't feel bad about it because it's just it's secondhand scrap wood. And also there's no need to kind of buy or use new wood when old wood's just as good, often actually better because the quality of old wood is often better than newer stuff. And wood's really expensive nowadays. So that's a really good one. And the welly boot hook is exactly the same. It's just, it's maybe it's slightly more advanced because it's a little bit more cutting. But another great one where it's, you just basically need a rectangle, cut a triangle down the top, get rid of that bit. That's where your boot goes in. That's what pulls it out. And then you need some way of standing up. It's exactly like those skate ramps I was making when I was seven. It's just a bit of wood like that with a thing in it for your boots and then something to hold it up. So again, you can put a you can put a brick under it. You can lean it just as a flat piece on a step to your door. You put a stone under it. You can get a bit of wood and drill it and attach it or glue it. Something to hold it up as a little foot. It can be a rectangle. It could be two little feet like that. All sorts of options. But it's just it's basically just a rectangle, split it, and then something to hold it up, stick your boot in there, pulls off. Brilliant. You can do the whole thing with just a saw and a drill, I'd say. It's a nice, easy thing to get into it and to start enjoying the process. But basically, it's just it's sanding and varnishing if you want to varnish it or paint it or wax it or don't leave it, just cut it and sand it. Or don't sand it if you want it rough. Like there's, there's so many different levels you can skill up 
depending on how much time you want to put into it, but also you can just get to learn the enjoyment of quite simple, monotonous tasks that allow you just to dive into your thoughts and think. I think that's brilliant. That's a really, they're really good projects there. So yeah, thanks. And then the second one, who should I speak to? Yes, I've actually got two for you on this one as well. Rory Landon Down and Harry Shaw. So they're both people I know from kind of filmmaking world. Harry is a director, producer, writer, all round absolute legend of a man. And Rory is a director, photographer, DOP. Again, both two of the nicest people I know. Brilliant filmmakers, both really interesting projects. But I think you'll really, you'll really like talking to them. Brilliant. I can't wait. Well, I'm sure they'll be an absolute delight. If you're recommending them, it'll be it'll be a pleasure to talk to them. So thank you so much for all of your wisdom and insight and accompanying me through the forest today, Adam. It's been an absolute joy. Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it. I'm glad. Well, thank you. And we'll see you next time for the next episode of Art After Dark. Bye. Bye. I really hope that you've enjoyed our conversation in the forest today. Remember to tag me on socials at artafterdark.co if you've been inspired to create or to share any thoughts on this episode. I'd absolutely love to hear from you and to see what you've been up to. You can find all images and details of the creations we discussed in the show notes on my website, louiseemily.com.